do we have free will? Do we really have a choice? And you could ask this question about anything in general, like our ability to stop sinning, or you can ask specifically about a sinner being unable to believe the gospel. So, the word free will in the Bible is only found in the Hebrew Old Testament. It's not directly in the Greek New Testament. Now, typically, the free will Freddies will read free will into certain terms like whosoever will or if thou wilt, um, which I'm not going to say that they're wrong, but I find it a bit conjectural uh, because the statement like whosoever will is observational. It just raises the, the condition, if you will, then this if true and this if false. It doesn't automatically imply absolute freedom of choice or personal causation. So, for example, if I said, uh, whosoever will be available on Wednesday to view my live stream, that doesn't automatically imply total choice on your part insofar as some of you could be at work during that time or you have a prior engagement of some sort or for whatever other reason you just don't want to or you don't have time. So there could be a choice but there might not necessarily be absolute choice. Now free will is a biblical concept. It's a word that's used in the Bible but with maybe one or two exceptions, it's almost always used in reference to the Old Testament offerings that were over and above the mandatory sacrifices. So you would have certain sacrifices that were required as an atonement for sins. The bull and the goat offerings and the shedding of blood and so on. And without going into all the theology behind that, those sacrifices foreshadow Christ, the mandatory offering for sins, whereas free will offerings on the other hand, that was an optional extra, if you like, that man could throw in there. And if you read Leviticus 22, it says that unlike the mandatory offerings, you could offer an animal that had some blemishes in some cases, as long as it wasn't for a vow offering. So whereas the vow offerings and the mandatory sacrifices had to be without blemish, the free will offerings could be with blemishes. And even in Ezra, giving gold and silver to the Lord was considered a free will gift of sorts. So then, contrasting free will and predestination or election, I can find where the Bible ties predestination and election as the reason why we are saved, which I have spoken of uh, before when looking at Ephesians 1. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where free will is given as the reason for being saved. Now, you, you can infer it, obviously, that's usually what people do. You can reason that it's there, and that's fine, but, but there's no absolute clear statement that you can to. So given what I've described about free will offerings in the Old Testament, there, there are multiple ways that you could interpret that, depending on which way you look at it, you know, you could say, you know, maybe you think that represents free will, maybe it represents our own works, maybe it represents Christ willingly giving himself, perhaps, you know, there's, there's different ways of, of looking at that. So obviously we can't be too dogmatic about that, it's too open to interpretation. So, I perceive that predestination and God's election is directly tied with the reason why we are saved, particularly in Ephesians 1. And some of the passages, uh, whereas free will is directly tied with our offerings over and above the required sacrifices. So that makes me a little bit suspicious of free will. Not not the people who proclaim it, but just the, the position in it itself or the concept in terms of giving it too much credence in salvation. Okay, There are certain passages where we tend to infer free will because of where the finger is pointed. So if we take Romans 1, the reprobate mind, they are the opposite of saved believers. Reprobate means rejected, basically. 
chosen Charlie will point out that it says multiple times, God gave them up, God gave them over. But Free Will Freddy pulls an ace from his sleeve and says that, well, God did that reactively because before he gave them up, the invisible things are clearly seen and they are without excuse. They knew God, they glorified him not as God and changed his incorruptible glory to corruptible man and changed the truth of God into a lie and so on. And so you are absolutely right. The fault there was placed straight on man and I don't dispute that at all. When we say that man does it entirely of his own free will, I think the issue there for me is the question of how free is free exactly. Free will Freddies will say that foreknowledge is not the same as predeterminism. Just because God knows something doesn't mean that he is sovereignly, personally making it happen in that sense. So, Charlie, chosen Charlie will flip that on his head and says that, well, if God knows everything anyway, and God already knows what decision I'm going to do, I can't really make any decision other than what God knows I'm going to make anyway, because otherwise God wouldn't know everything. And so I was always going to make the decision that God already knew I was going to make. Okay. This is this is not a uniquely Christian problem. Uh, secular philosophy has the exact same dilemma, really. So, in a philosoph in a philosophical sense, yes, you could argue that if God knows everything, we can only choose to do what he already knows we're going to do. So I, I get that from a philosophical sense, and I get what Chosen Charlie is saying there. But I don't think that's in any way practical. You know, the Bible still tells us to do things and says, if you do this, as if there is at least a perceived choice. So I still think we have to look at it from a practical point of view. So in a practical sense, if you're able to say within yourself, well, God already knows what I'm going to do, so why bother trying to do anything? Well, by that same token, you're able to say within yourself, I'll make sure that he writes a good story about me. Yeah? Now, let's take the potter and the clay analogy from Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah visits potter's house, and potter fashions two lumps of clay into two vessels. And God uses this to teach Jeremiah that God can do to Jeremiah what the potter did to the vessel. The chosen Charlies will interpret the potter clay analogy like um, sort of a Wallace and Grom kind of a scene, or a morph scene, where God is moving the arms, taking a picture, moving the legs a bit, taking a picture, moving some more, take a picture. Personally, I think that's a little bit of a stretch of the illustration, but I'll explain it. The potter is making a vessel. Okay, the vessel has a purpose. Now, I don't have the... Uh, cutlery with me or the crockery to make this illustration but let's take a large plate one that you could put a pizza on or a large dinner on and then a small plate which would maybe only be big enough for a sandwich and then a bowl for soup or cereal something like that and then a small bowl that's maybe only big enough for a cat food or a bit of jam or jello if you have the steaks and maybe a spork now Obviously these, it's not a great illustration insofar as these vessels, the, the plate, the bowl, they, they don't make conscious decisions. But later in Jeremiah, God says, I will speak concerning a nation to pluck it up, pull down and destroy it. If that nation against whom I pronounce turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So I would argue or reason from that. If it were so that a nation can only do what God is controlling it to do, it would make more sense if God just pronounced what he's going to do, and it, it would be irreversible. So just say you're going to destroy the nation. Don't give a condition, okay? But he does give a condition and a way out. Now, there were nations that didn't repent, but in Jonah, we have an example of a nation that did repent. Of, and this is repentance of evil. This is not about repentance to salvation. So let's pretend that these vessels have free will. The, the plate, the, the big plate, the small plate, the, the bowl. Okay. Or at least some seeming ability to be able to make a choice. Okay. 
Now, it would be unreasonable to ask the small plate to hold my tin of soup so I can have soup for my lunch or dinner. If I got angry at the plate for spilling my soup all over the table, that has more to do with me choosing the wrong vessel to hold that soup. Okay. But on the flip side, the plate also didn't ask to be made into a plate instead of a bowl. The plate was just born a plate and can do what a small plate can do. Now, if I ask the small bowl to hold my soup, well, it would be able to hold some of my soup, but not all of it. Now, I'm talking about a small bowl that's maybe big enough for cat food or something like that. Okay, so it's going to hold some of it, but it's still going to make a mess. Let's pretend then, for this illustration, that the, the tin of soup is the righteousness of the law. Okay, well, you might be able to, if, and you're the small bowl in this illustration here. Well, you might be able to keep some of the law, but you're not going to be able to keep all of it. So the plates are going to be able to keep even a smaller bit of the law than the small bowl can. But most of it they won't be able to hold. The spiritual Pharisees of our day are going to keep a little bit more of the law than some of the people watching this video. But Jesus, the big bowl, he kept the whole law, okay, without spilling any of it outside of the bowl, okay? If righteousness is needed for the big plate and the small plate, then the only way that can happen is for Christ's righteousness to be imputed onto them, that, that new nature that is Christ. So again, I'm sorry I haven't got these instruments with me to actually explain, but let's suppose we've got a plate. It needs to hold that tin of soup. It needs to hold the law but it can't hold all of the law. It can hold very little of the law. But then Christ is the big bowl that can hold the entire tin of soup. And we can put a bowl on top of the plate. And that's sometimes what they'll do in the restaurants. The plate is like a saucer on a cup of sauce, or it's there, you know, in a real illustration, it would catch some of the soup that spilled over, or it would be there to hold the butter or some bread. But, but you can put the bowl on top of the plate, okay? Whether it's a small plate or a large plate, as long as the bowl is a... A reasonable size but the spiritual pharisees in our day are telling us no that's not how it works you need to actually turn into the big bowl instead of being a plate but they deceive themselves because they're a, a small bowl thinking that they're a big bowl okay so here's the problem with those pharisees i can easily put a big bowl on top of a big, a big plate uh, I, and there will be some spare room for the bread, maybe around the edge of the plate. I can put a big bowl on a small plate, but putting a bowl on a very small plate, there's, there's less room around the edge there, but it does fit on the plate. On a very small bowl, again, one that's big enough for uh, a very, very small amount of cat food or something, it's, it's harder to put a big bowl on top of a smaller bowl. It's more likely to fall off the edge, or you know, it might not be very stable. Again, I know this depends on the shapes of the bowl, so you just have to bear with the illustration here. Now, for the time being, uh, I, I have use for this small bowl. It, it, it does still have a purpose, a small bowl, right? If you want to feed your cat, it's probably easy for the cat to eat out of a bowl that's more appropriate for the size of the food than a, a big bowl that's more suitable for a human, unless you want your cat to make a mess everywhere. Um, the reason I use the cat illustration is just because there, there were a few weeks ago there was a neighbour's cat who used to come to my house feeling sorry for herself because she only had one breakfast and life is cruel, so she'd come to my house for second breakfast. Just like how God had use for Pharaoh in the Old Testament and bore him with much patience, but eventually God had no more use for Pharaoh. So what do you do with something that's useless? You throw it away. You had a small bowl suitable to feed a cat, but then let's say the cat dies or the cat got taken away, or for whatever reason you don't have a cat anymore, well then a cat bowl is pretty much useless, isn't it? It doesn't serve any purpose if you don't have a cat, right? Or, you know, a small bowl that you never use just for whatever reason. So you either put it on the shelf for, if you do have a use for it later, or you throw it away, ultimately. 
or if you've you know if you've got nowhere to dispose it and it's not made of clay you would burn it or something so we could argue that mankind makes choices and whether you call that free will depends on again how, how free are you are you making free there how, how are you defining free but the plate didn't choose to be a plate the bowl didn't choose to be a bowl so if the potter makes a vessel with a particular design and purpose it can only make choices that are in accordance with its design and purpose okay a plate can't choose to hold the whole law because it can only hold, hold a very small amount of the law at best using that in a super illustration so likewise a cat will make choices it makes because it has the nature of a cat or a dog it makes the, the decisions that a dog would make i could also make the free will decision to spend half a day licking myself as cats do or you know whatever dogs do but i'm not going to do that because i'm a human being okay i use a shower instead i have the nature of a human being and i didn't choose the nature of a human being as, as i've said before in the series there was no pre-birth interview um but on the flip side though the cat or the dog hasn't got the free will to learn the english language you know into a complex degree it hasn't got the mouth muscles for a start it hasn't got the lips and it hasn't got the brain capacity to understand an entire complex language like that so whereas previously in the series i have espoused views that perhaps align a little bit more with the chosen child is this is one where i would give some room for the free will fred is in that i don't say that we don't have any free will or any ability to make choice whatsoever i, I don't think that god knowing any, anything has to need to negate or cancel out our, our given ability to make decisions if god has designed us with the seeming ability to make decisions we just don't have foresight to know what decisions we're going to make because if we had that foresight we, we'd at least try and make better decisions we? but I, I would add a disclaimer to that and say well we we don't have total choice though we, we are limited by our nature and the parameters of freedom the boundaries of freedom that god has put on top of us so we didn't ask to be born sinners we didn't ask for god's permission to create us or sorry we didn't give god permission to create us we didn't ask to have corrupted flesh we're just stuck with it and we are confined to the limits of choice that god has given us either it's eternal life or it's eternal torment that there is no opt-out system for the atheist or the agnostic or whoever okay so we are forced into one of the two choices so when someone tells me sinners reject god by their own free will in a way they do but but they are workers of iniquity by nature they make choices that befit their nature okay and if if the free will freddies want to say that everything we do is a choice well then even if you are saved by grace and you believe that why not choose to live a sinlessly perfect life anyway why aren't you choosing to do that why didn't you choose to follow the law before you got saved when you did have a works-based salvation why didn't you just choose to follow the law and never make a mistake why are you sat there listening to me now when you could be out there you know doing something more useful with your time or preaching the gospel or praying or reading the bible for yourself instead of watching my videos to teach you and of course some of you might say to me well i can't it's too difficult or i can't control my dark thoughts or i just i don't understand this or i don't understand that even when i try to do it for myself or i just want to be edified or i'm tired i'm beaten down you know i've, I've read this passage multiple times and i don't understand this so what i'm trying to say is maybe i'm just saying maybe your free will is somewhat overrated because it's not entirely dependable maybe you're just really bad at making good decisions like a little child and you ought to have childlike faith and let your father in heaven make that decision for you I'm just posing the question just putting that out there and in terms of why people reject the gospel you know if you want to say that it's entirely their choice to do so the thing that you have to understand is the message of the cross the bible tells us is foolishness to them that perish right so 
when you preach Christ crucified to a lost person, you are preaching something that is contradictory to his carnal mind. You are asking him to believe on Christ. You are asking him to make a choice that doesn't make a lot of sense to him. And it's because of his nature. Men love darkness rather than light. And so when he says to you, I choose to reject the gospel because dot 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 whatever his reason might be i know this may seem not what you commonly think is is going on but he often he's he, excuse me he's not actually looking for you to answer his objections so that he can reconsider his position rather he is looking for reasons to justify why he already rejects god okay and if you challenge his reasoning he will look for a backup excuse and i've seen this out so okay so and so what i'm saying is god somehow in some way needs to open the blindness that's on a man's eyes in order for him to be able to see clearly and know that the message of the cross is not foolishness it's, it's our hope otherwise asking asking him to choose the gospel is a bit like saying to a blind man hey i've, I've got a choice of different colors here okay you know you want to match your curtains and your carpet and make sure that your room's all matching choose the best color that matches your room <laughs> well he has a choice sure he could say he has free will sure but he can't see clearly enough to make the right choice and so if we say that mankind rejects God because of his own free will, I do sort of agree with you. I'm not even trying to argue against you there. But I would submit to you maybe that free will is part of the problem rather than the solution in that regard. Because free will persistently drives the majority of man to reject the gospel you know, if, assuming that we all have total free will and we all have free will to believe the gospel, well, it does drive the vast majority of people to reject the gospel, not believe the gospel. Whereas predestination, on the other hand, leads to 100% of the elect to salvation without fail. It never fails. Okay. So to give free will too much credence and to say that it's all just a simple matter of choice, it's almost as if you're saying that free will is both the cause of and the solution to the problem. To, to me, it's like that famous quote. I, I know this is not a godly cartoon, but if you think of the Simpsons, Homer Simpson, he has a famous quote that became a meme. Alcohol is the cause of and the solution to all of life's problems. Or it's like saying, uh, another way you could look at it in biblical terms, we've all broken God's law, but we need to repent of our sins and obey the law to be saved. Okay, now I realise people might object to that, and I'm not saying that if you believe in free will, you're teaching works. I'm not implying that. I'm just trying to explain to you why I don't trust it all that much. I'm just a, a bit suspicious of it. I think our free will is really what led us to cock up in the first place, because we loved darkness rather than light, because our deeds were evil, okay? And our deeds were evil because we were yet sinners. So we made the free will decisions that sinful people make who are darkness. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand me here. The gospel should be simple. When Brother James, who you've seen on my channel, uh, and we've done door-to-door uh, -door soul winning together, it's been a, a while since we've been out for personal reasons, unfortunately. But when we've been out door-to-door -door in the past, you know, when we're talking to people at the doors, we don't go into all of this stuff with people. Now, obviously, if somebody asked me, I'd be happy to talk about it, but I, I wouldn't bring this conversation up with those outside of the faith or with Christians that don't know the basics of the gospel. I wouldn't go into predestination and election. It's, it's mainly a, a topic that's relegated to be discussed with other saved believers. And I wish, we, I wish we could talk about it more without people getting so wound up about it, but it is what it is. So, when presenting the gospel, 
it is helpful to use choice type language like whosoever will if you believe i think that's very helpful and practical to somebody who has a carnal mind and i believe that that's how jesus and the apostles evangelized so that's good enough for me another angle that you could look at this is john 1 that the sons of god are not born according to the will of man but the will of god now it, i grant you it doesn't say free will but we can take that verse to mean that we do have a will of sorts so yes man has a will but his will is contrary to the will of god and man's own will can't birth him into a child of god according to that verse so i think there's a very good reason why john's gospel gives us these conditions like whosoever will but doesn't strictly use the term free will because his gospel also tells us that unbelievers are in bondage i'm thinking john chapter 8 i think where you know servant of, of sin and so on and it says if the son shall set you free because we we were in bondage our will was in bondage now a lot of free will freddies might be panicking there and saying that that sounds like total depravity you know this is the calvinist thing that they use all this word sounded like man is so totally depraved he can't choose to be saved or whatever obviously our natural instincts can we can smell calvinism like fart in a lift and our initial reaction is to rebuke anything that sounds remotely like it i understand that but remember there are loads of unsaved catholics and pentecostals and jw's and so on for whom free will is a major cornerstone to their doctrines particularly of losing salvation so bear that in mind the problem with calvinism and arminianism and the nitty-gritty of deep catholic theology is that it's a fancy collection of alphabet soup and word salad invented by a bunch of bible college armchair theologians who managed to make every time of the doctrine complicated including the gospel and they want to sound all poetic like charles spurgeon you know they use big swelling words sound like they're god's greatest poet that ever lived or whatever and they want to make you look intellectually inferior because that's how they sleep at night deceiving themselves into thinking that they're right and these armchair theologians you know they explain the gospel like they're writing a thesis to get a phd or something total depravity is really just poetic word solid to make everything sound overly sensational and dramatic you know mankind is just so unimaginatively depraved and radically corrupt that without the efficacious iris irresistible prevenient enabling grace of the divine author of light you know they cannot possibly all that sort of stuff that they come out with and of course we all want to slap them in the face because they're so pompous and irritating and we don't understand half of what they just said anyway the truth is far simple as I used the illustration before, an unsaved person is blind. He can't see properly. And it's the blind leading the blind, of course. Yet a little while the light is with you, but before you yet have the light, but men love darkness rather than light. Therein lies the problem. You are trying to shine the light on somebody who can't see properly. Someone who loves the darkness and is spiritually asleep. And it's a lot easier to sleep in the dark, of course. And by default, as I said, the message of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. The idea of a free eternal gift that doesn't fade away, is, doesn't require any works, it, it's nonsense to most of these people. Look at all these fools that we have in Christianity who love James chapter 2 more than any other chapter in the whole Bible. They, they, don't, you know, they don't go home at the end of the day saying to themselves, thank you dear satan for allowing us to bird in hell with our lordship doctrine i know that's you know jokingly how faith art ministry portrays them you know his reprobate impression but he is just joking okay they don't go home saying thank you dear satan for our work salvation in actuality i know we portray them that way i know i've kind of portrayed them that way in my second documentary but they in reality they have the same feeling of righteousness about what they're doing and preaching 
that we have uh, about what we do and what we preach. Okay, so when you appeal to their decisionism or their choice to believe what we believe, you are asking them to believe something that they think is unbiblical and complete nonsense. Okay. A free gift that doesn't require a changed life, you know, that's antinomianism, that's sin excusing, you know, that's Satan in the garden, thou shalt not surely die, and so on. It, it's foolishness to the people that we preach it to. And the feelings reciprocated. Obviously, we think that their lordship salvation is vain, jangling, double talking politician speak. So, what they believe is equally as nonsensical to us as what we say is to them. Okay. And so, the problem isn't so much that they're totally depraved, that they can't choose righteousness, because, in a manner of speaking, many Christians do actually choose righteousness, but they they seek it by the law. In a, in a roundabout way, you know, repent of sins, surrender, you know, follow all the Ten Commandments, all that stuff. They do actually seek righteousness, but they seek righteousness by the law, not by faith. Okay, that's the key difference. And therein lies the problem that he, work salvation guy, he's blind, he's spiritually void, void. he's a bona fide idiot, pardon my language. I could tie him to a chair and give him 40 blows to the head with the King James Bible, and he'll still think that he's right because he's being persecuted for the kingdom's sake if I do that to him. Yeah. And so, yeah, he, he could, hypothetically speaking, freely choose to believe in Christ. Nobody's particularly stopping him, but because it's foolishness to him, and because he's so sure about himself in what he's wrong about, he won't. Okay. And the only way that that's going to happen, somehow, is if God removes the veil from across his eyes. Now, I can't sit here and tell you on a case-by-case -case basis for every individual person why that happens to one person and not another person. I'm not qualified to make that kind of a judgment. The wind blows where it will. You can't tell from where it came or where it's going. So is everyone that's born again. I know that this has been a bit of a longer video, so I'll, I'll finish on this last sort of talking point here. I sometimes get criticised by the conditional insecurity types with the same old boring drivel. You're denying free will after somebody's saved. Of course you can lose salvation because free will. It's as if they think that just throwing the word free will into the air somehow magically negates Jesus' unpluckable hand. Well, my answer to these people really is your free will can perish with you. The sons of God are born according to the will of God, not the will of man. You know, it's kind of like Peter said in John 6, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ. So when someone says, well, you're saying that we lose free will after we get saved because you believe in eternal security. Well, the thing is, I say to these people, maybe your faith is so weak and worthless that you might walk away from the faith. We don't all have that problem. And it's not that we don't have that problem because we're so good and we're just awesome Christians. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just that I, I don't know where else to go. Like, where else would I go? Like, I don't know where to go. So there, there isn't really a choice there as far as I'm concerned. So that's all I have to say on the topic for now. Um, you know, if I think of other stuff, I'll maybe have to put it into a separate video, I guess. But that, that's kind of all I'd, I'd really say on free will. It's not, I'm not denying choice. I'm not taking away our will. I just think that to an extent our will is in bondage and it's contrary to the will of God. That's really all I can say on it.